Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Today I want to look at William Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew. This video is intended to help out GCSE, A-level and international baccalaureate students. From my research, The Taming of the Shrew is a set text for all of those qualifications. Similarly, I think it's going to be useful for actors and directors hoping to stage the play because the question I'm asking, and ideally answering, comes from both sample exam questions, but also the rehearsal room. Namely, how do we stage The Taming of the Shrew? We date the writing and perhaps first production of William Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew to around 1590 or 1591. This is quite early in his playwriting career. The play itself, as we know it, is not published until the first folio of 1623, however. With Taming of the Shrew, William Shakespeare is attempting to write a comedy on relationships, marriage, the roles of men and women. To understand just why early modern audiences would have found this story funny in the way it's presented, we have to understand how they understood the gender roles. And to do that, we have to understand how they saw their physical health and their society. Firstly, we have to understand the four humours. And I've got a video on that, which I'm going to leave linked in a card above here. Fundamentally, men and women are different for early modern people. And that is at the humoral level. Men are hot and dried, women are cold and wet. Men are perfectly formed, women are imperfectly formed. They are cold and wet because they have not been properly cooked. Because their humours are fundamentally out of balance at their birth, women need headship, according to early modern people. That headship, of course, comes from a father, a brother and eventually a husband. Women cannot be left to their own devices because they are, to early modern people, fundamentally the weaker sex, both humorally, but also arguably spiritually and morally. When a woman is shrewish or aggressive, when she attempts to take charge and control a man, that is a distortion in the natural order, the chain of being. Now, here is an image of how the chain of being was understood. At the top, we see Christ, God and the angels. Coming down, we see the people of various degrees, animals, plants, minerals, objects. Within the chain of being at the human level, kings will sit above dukes, who will sit above lords, who will sit above gentry, yeomen and so on. Within the household, that chain of being also operates. The man is the head of the household, the woman is his helpmeet, Beneath them, the children, the servants, the livestock. Anything that deviates from that is a disordering of that natural world. When a woman potentially cheats on her husband, yes, she has committed the sin of adultery, but her husband is also to blame. The cuckold is ripe for ridicule because he has improperly headed his household. Like a king or a monarch at the top of their kingdom, if there are problems, if there are rebellions, then not only are the people to blame, but potentially their monarchy also. When a wife is disobedient, verbally or even sexually, her husband must bear part of the blame. Because she is imperfectly formed, it was his duty to train her up, to school her into how to be a proper, functioning member of his household. Should he fail to do that, as shown by her behaviour, he is the one at fault. In addition to the social construct in which he lived, when Shakespeare went touting for inspiration for his play, he would not have had to look far. The Bible is full of stories of shrewish women, disobedient women, women who lead weak men astray. Adam is led astray by Eve in the Garden of Eden. When Shakespeare was growing up, his England and particularly his Stratford-upon-Avon would have had a host of visiting players he would have been taught about the classical literature, full of these moralising tales of women improperly headed. Similarly, if we look here at the RSC's website, they highlight a connection with the anonymous verse tale, Here beginneth a merry jest 
of a shrewd and cursed wife, lapped in moral skin for her good behaviour from 1550. In this tale, as the RSC points out, two sisters, one meek, one headstrong, marry two men. The headstrong sister is beaten, stripped, and her bleeding body is wrapped in the salted skin of her husband's dead, flayed horse, Moral. Her husband is the person that has committed these atrocities in order to teach her meekness. As the RSC's website points out, unsurprisingly, it works. It is interesting to me that in highlighting this, the RSC is drawing comparison between this anonymous verse story and Shakespeare's play. They are quick to highlight how different Petruchio's treatment of Kate is. There is no flaying of horses in this one, no beating, no salting of skin. But in doing so, they distance Shakespeare's play from being read as an abuse narrative. And as we go through, I would like to question whether that's appropriate, responsible or even accurate. It goes without saying that Taming of the Shrew differs wildly from this original text. Petruchio is not presented as being overtly physically violent to Kate. He doesn't strip, whip, beat her. He doesn't wrap her bloodied body in the salted carcass of his flayed horse. But isn't there a violence there? In describing her as a hawk, does he not deny her humanity? Hawks are undeniably majestic birds. They are elite objects for privileged men to own. And while this is not problematic for the early modern mindset, where wives were, of course, chattel of husband, is it not problematic for us? The hawk must be tamed and trained. They are hoodwinked, their eyes covered, they are kept under the thumb and wrapped around the little finger, so they may be held in the hand. And I think that modern audiences in particular what we love about Kate, her sharp wit, her quick, vicious tongue, her agile mind, all of that gets trained out of her. Because of Petruchio's erratic and potentially could be read as being abusive behaviour, all of those things that we so enjoy about her get stripped away. And so when we ask the question of how do we or should we stage Taming of the Shrew, I think we have to engage with that. Do we play these moments as comedy, as potentially Shakespeare's audience would have seen them? Or, in light of the way the world is now, its problems that still need to be faced and dealt with, do we stage these moments as being the abuse that we now read them as being? For me, when it comes to deciding about how we're going to stage this play, there are a few moments that I think set up the way the whole play works. They are the taming scenes and the final speech. And for actors and directors, and potentially even for those sitting exams, you need to decide, and there's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer for it, how you are going to stage these moments. Because in doing so, I believe it instructs the way the rest of the play works. These are the moments, the backbone, if you will, of the world of the play. When looking at the different and conflicted ways that these taming scenes can be read and performed, we need to go to Petruchio's country house to act four of the play, scenes one, three and five. And I'm going to pull up moments from these scenes that I think can be read in two different ways. As we see here at the end of act four, scene one, Petruchio is determined to find fault or perform finding fault with everything his servants do for him. Kate is unnerved. She says, I pray you, husband, be not so disquiet. The meat was well, if you were so contented. He, deliberately contrary, says, I tell thee, Kate, t'was burnt and dried away, and I expressly am forbid to touch it, for it engenders choler, planteth anger, and better t'were both of us did fast, since of ourselves, ourselves are choleric than feed it with such over-roasted flesh. Be patient, tomorrow it shall be mended, and for this night we'll fast for company. Come, I will bring thee to thy bridal chamber. 
When staging or discussing this short interchange, we can either see Petruchio as being a clown fooling around, or we can potentially read it with its darker implication. Yes, he hasn't hit Kate, but in beating his servants in front of her, he shows her that he's willing to beat people. He is essentially warning her that if her behaviour is not satisfactory, she may be on the receiving end of his violent physical rage. Additionally, he denies her food. He takes the food away from her. This could be staged as a really uncomfortable, challenging moment. A hungry Kate who is told she now cannot eat till tomorrow. How does Kate respond to that physically? Is she distressed? Is she frightened? Does she laugh at him? All of these choices that a director or actor can make shape the plot. They start telling an audience which way we're going. Is this going to be the comedic Taming of the Shrew? Or is it going to take a darker, potentially more tragic turn? If we move on to Act 4, Scene 3, we swiftly realise that Petruchio is not content with his own erratic behaviour being used to frighten and alter Kate. Indeed, he has now employed his servant Grumio in a similar attempt. At the start of the scene, as his master had done in scene one, Grumio presents Kate with food and then takes it away. He mocks her and teases her. He says, what say you to a neat's foot? Tis passing good. I prithee, let me have it. I fear it is to cholerica meat. How say you to a fat tripe finely broiled? I like it well. Good Grumio, fetch it me. I cannot tell. I fear it is choleric. What say you to a piece of beef and mustard? A dish that I do love to feed upon. Aye, but the mustard is too hot a little. Why then, the beef and let the mustard rest? Nay then, I will not. You shall have the mustard, or else you'll get no beef of Grumio. Then both, or one, or anything thou wilt. Why then, the mustard without the beef? Go, get thee gone, thou false deluding slave. She beats him. He has tormented her to such degree that she has now raised her hands against him. Is this played as comedy? Once again, a clown larking with his mistress. Or is this a darker turn? A painfully hungry woman, desperate to eat, being denied by Petruchio and those he surrounds himself with. Is this becoming a group effort to torment and abuse her by denying her a basic human need that is food? Petruchio enters and begins to make demands of how Kate should behave. Pluck up thy spirits, look cheerfully upon me. Here, love, thou seest how diligent I am to dress thy meat myself and bring it thee. I am sure, sweet Kate, this kindness merits thanks. What, not a word? Nay, then thou lovest it not, and all my pains is sorted to no proof. Here, take away this dish. What Petruchio is setting up here is that her basic needs will not be met because she is a person worthy of being treated as such. She will only get her most basic needs for survival met if she conforms to the way he wants her to behave. Later on in the scene, Petruchio decides that her clothing that he's having made for her is not good enough. Before her, he acts once again erratically. He mocks the tailor's work. He becomes enraged, saying that the gown has been marred. He decides that she will have no new gown. He sends the tailor away and says, Well, come, my Kate. We will unto your fathers, even in these honest, mean habiliments. Our purses shall be proud, our garments poor. For tis the mind that makes the body rich. And as the sun breaks through the darkest clouds, so honour peereth in the meanest habit. What is the jay more precious than the lark, because his feathers are more beautiful? Or is the adder better than the eel, because his painted skin contents the eyes? Oh no, good Kate, neither art thou the worse for this poor furniture and mean array, if thou accountst it shame, lay it on me, and therefore frolic. We will henceforth with to feast and sport us at thy father's house. Go, call my men, and let us straight to him, and bring our horses unto Long Lane End. There we will mount, and thither walk on foot. Let's see. I think it is now some seven o'clock, and well we may come there by dinner time. She responds, perhaps angrily, perhaps fearfully, perhaps utterly worn down. I dare assure you, sir, tis almost two, 
and twill be supper time ere you come there. He responds, it shall be seven ere I go to horse. Look what I speak or do or think to do. You are still crossing it. Sirs, let's alone. I will not go today and ere I do, it shall be what o'clock I say it is. In contradicting him, he removes any chance she has of seeing her father. He has sent the food away. He has sent the tailor away. She stands there, not in the clothes she was promised, with a rumbling belly. And on top of this, the promise to go to her father's house, where she may have hoped for some help, respite, and certainly a meal, has now been taken away. In Act 4, Scene 5, the audience and the reader is forced to confront Petruchio's attempt to control Kate. We see his actions and the effect they have upon her. At the start of the scene, as we see here, they are disagreeing over whether the sun is the sun or the moon. Petruchio wrongly, in daytime, calls the sun the moon. Kate attempts to disagree. Petruchio doubles down. She disagrees again. Petruchio, now by my mother's son, and that's myself, it shall be the moon or star or what I list, or ere I journey to your father's house, go on and fetch our horses back again, ever more crossed and crossed, nothing but crossed. Hortensio warns her, say as he says, or we shall never go. Kate, forward I pray, since we have come so far, and be it moon or sun or what you please, and if you please to call it a rush candle, henceforth I vow it shall be so for me. Petruchio, I say it is the moon. Kate, I know it is the moon. Petruchio, nay then you lie, it is the blessed sun. Kate, then, God be blessed, it is the blessed sun, but the sun it is not when you say it is not, and the moon changes even as your mind, what you will have named it, even that it is, and so it shall be for Katharina. Hortensio, Petruchio, go thy ways, the field is won. Petruchio, it seems, relents, saying, well, forward, forward, thus the bowl should run, and not unluckily against the bias, but soft, company is coming here. The company that he mentions is an ageing man, not content with making Kate call the sun, the moon, the moon, the sun, and whatever might please his fancy, he now demands that she again eschew her logic and refer to this elderly man as a young virgin. Petruchio, good morrow, gentle mistress, where away? Tell me, sweet Kate, and tell me truly too, hast thou beheld a fresher gentlewoman, such war of white and red within her cheeks, what stars do spangle heaven with such beauty, as those two eyes become that heavenly face, fair, lovely maid? Once more good day to thee, sweet Kate, embrace her for her beauty's sake. Kate does not miss a beat, she does not contradict Petruchio now. Young, budding virgin, fair and fresh and sweet. Whither away, or where is thy abode? Happy the parents of so fair a child, happier the man whom favourable stars allot thee for his lovely bedfellow. Petruchio. Why, how now, Kate? I hope thou art not mad. This is a man, old, wrinkled, faded, withered, and not a maiden as thou say he is. Kate. Pardon, old father, my mistaking eyes that have been so bedazzled with the sun that everything I look on seemeth green. Now I perceive thou art a reverend father. Pardon, I pray thee, for my mad mistaking. Like the hawk, he has covered her eyes with the vision he wants her to see of the world. He has wrapped her round his little finger and he has her under the thumb. And of course, this moment can be staged as comedy. Only, I think, if Kate remains resolute. She may say all the right things, but she needs to do it with a cocked eyebrow and perhaps a sneer. If she says it meekly, if she bows her head and looks afraid, if she looks uncomfortable and hungry, cold and sad, then however much clowning Petruchio does, it does have that darker edge. Petruchio can say his words in any way, but for me, I think the way Kate responds to them, how she physically stands and says those lines, shapes the scene. It tells us whether this is a comedy or whether this is something far darker. Are we 
as modern readers and modern stagers, happy to present this moment unquestioningly as comedy. Now, this is not by any means me saying that Shakespeare's players and audiences wouldn't have unquestionably read it as comedy. My question is, do we? And actually, should we? How we choose to stage those moments or read those moments as unquestioning comedy or with that slightly darker edge then affects the way that Kate's final speech should be presented in Act 5, Scene 2. Here is that final speech in which it would appear she attempts to teach women how to be loyal, loving wives to their husbands, how to do their duty as women should. It seems on the surface that she has cast away any and all shrewishness. Her tongue is no longer sharp, it is in the service of her lord. Now I think if we have played the earlier moments I discussed as comedy, then a modern audience is going to require and perhaps expect that this last speech be played a very particular way. Kate says these things through gritted teeth. We know she does not really mean them. Perhaps she kicks Petruchio. Her spite may be shown physically. That, I think, is the only way that we can play this as comedy. A modern audience would perhaps have problems with her suddenly becoming demure, without there being any edge left. However, is it perhaps as interesting, maybe even more so, to have her play this speech as it is written? If we have played those earlier moments with a darker edge, then this speech can be performed as it is written, that Kate is almost brainwashed, reciting the litany that her new husband demands her recite, singing and dancing to the tune that he has written for her. In short, if we choose to play Petruchio's taming of Kate as comedy, then I believe that a modern audience will not accept that taming taking place. That her final speech has to continue in the aggressive and shrewish way that her earlier speeches did. The words cannot match the action. So, if we want them to, if we want our shrew tamed, then those earlier moments I don't think can be comedic. What Petruchio perpetrates against Kate is gaslighting and coercive control. I say gaslighting because he alters her perception of reality. He forces her to acknowledge the world looks a way that it actually doesn't. He forces her to see through his distorted eyes in a way that is deceptive, confusing and maddening. It is coercive control because he denies her food, sleep, clothing and basic humanity. Fortunately, I now live in a nation that recognises coercive control as being a crime, an act of domestic violence. If somebody treats their spouse or a member of their household in this way, they can be charged with that crime. And I'm going to leave a link to the work of Laura Richards and what she says about coercive control because she's a chief campaigner for this change in law. And hopefully that will help to explain why I see this play as being as problematic as I do. If, however, you are studying this play or you're looking to stage it, then may I direct you to this. The RSC is staging The Taming of the Shrew. It will be in production in Stratford Avon until the 31st of August 2019, and then they're taking it on an English tour until 2020. As you can see, there's also a cinema screening on the 5th of June 2019. It looks really interesting to me because the RSC seems to be playing with the gender norms. As you can see, they have reimagined England as a matriarchy, and it is in that matriarchy that they are setting their Taming of the Shrew. So I'm certainly going to make every effort to go and see this, either in Stratford or when it goes on tour or in cinemas if I can't make it to a theatre. I'd love to know what you think of the things I've discussed in this video, of the upcoming RSC production, and also if there's any other plays by Shakespeare or early modern dramatists that you'd like me to look at, either in full or elements of them for your exams or perhaps because you're planning to stage them, do let me know in the comment section down below. Alternatively, please come and find me over on my social media, links in the description box. You can follow me there and talk about things that you'd like me to make a video on. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please let me know by clicking the like button, 
please also subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.